It's Atlanta's number one hip-hop station, Hot 1079 and home for the Ricky Smiley Morning Show. Of course, you know it's your foe, b High Radio Shout is stepping in the building. I got a Memphis 10 legend in this thing. DJ Paul, what's good with it, boss? What up, what up, what up, homie? I mean, feeling good, feeling great, man. I mean, I know you coming in, you just doing shows and all this stuff, tearing up stages. Yeah. Tell me about that. Man, we just rocked the masquerade in ATL, man. It's been a minute since I've been in ATL, so it was great, man. The love was... Crazy man, we had a good time, man, and uh, I got I got to get back down here some more, man. They've been begging me to come down here for a minute, but um, I always seem to get booked somewhere else outside of Atlanta, this and that. So I always ready, I always ready to get back to Atlanta because Atlanta was a lot of people probably don't know. Atlanta was the first city that that uh blew up Three Six Mafia. Yes, sir. Because we came here, man. We came here a long time ago in a Mazda rental car. Me, Juicy J, Coopster, and I think Lord Infamous or whatever. And we had a chick driving us. We squashed up in this car. And we came to Atlanta a long time ago in like 1994, I think it was, and started promoting records. And Atlanta been messing with us ever since, man. So it's always good to come back to Atlanta. Everybody for the longest, everybody thought Three Six Mafia people was from Atlanta. <laughs> I mean, because it was a lot of love down here for the music, yeah, man. When and the come, crunk music. Exactly. When it comes to the crunk music, I mean, y'all crunk that stuff up like none other. Mm-hmm. I mean, the whole sample game that y'all in- incorporated into that was just stupid. You know, folks would take other records, but we would hear y'all take stuff out of movies and everything else yeah. and put it into them tracks. But then we would be like, how the hell did they put that 808 up under there like that, oh, man? Oh, yeah, I created that 808. I made that 808 when I was in, uh, like, the eighth grade. Oh, man. I made that 808, you know. So um, it's, it's been a good thing, man. Atlanta been messing. I remember the first show we did in Atlanta. Uh-huh. So funny. We was opening up for MAC-10. Ooh. And uh, this was back in the day. We was opening up for MAC-10. And um, we didn't even have – parking spaces in the back of the club we had to park in the in the crowd with the rest of the uh yeah. the fans you know the rest of the people and uh we went in there we was walking across the parking lot it's so funny we was walking across the parking lot we had on these black um uh, we had on black khaki jeans mm-hmm. i mean khaki pants black shirts that said three six mafia we come from memphis we had jerry curls and everything <laughs> and one dude one of my boys had jerry curls and one, one dude from uh the crowd from atlanta said who did they do easy or something <laughs> 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 we pop way across the parking lot we walk in through the front of the door you know it took years to get that, that respect but look we walk through the front of the door we go in there and we tear it up we tear it up, and then the stage was wet from the opening acts. Yeah. So while we crunk on the stage, we was even crunker because we slipping. Ooh. So we about to fall. We like <laughs> man. We like <laughs> we wild and cra- we wild hell on the stage. So it was so crazy. So um, but after that, the show promoter called us back two weeks later. Yeah. And booked the show. We did that show for free. Yeah. I said, I'm going to do this one for free. I guarantee you we're going to rock it. And then we're going to come back and we're going to get paid for this other one. Ooh. And then we came back, and next thing I know, we started doing shows in ATL, man, like every few months or so, man. And it was, it was good. I mean, talking about them early days, man, I mean, jumping out there with that Mystic Style. Yeah, what that's what that we like? was doing, Mystic Style. Tell the club up. How did y'all feel putting Memphis on the map at that time, though? Because as far as the rap scene was concerned, you know we had Ball and G and, you know, a host of others getting busy. But, I mean, the Mafia, a hypnotized Count Posse, y'all had about 20 folks in there getting yeah. busy. Yeah. So what was that like coming up with all them creative folk? Man, it was good because, you know, Memphis is a um, musical city. Yeah. Like you said, we had A-Ball and MJG. We had Gangsta Pad. Yeah. Gangsta Pad ended up moving down here to Atlanta. Huh. But uh, um, it was it was cool because we had a different sound. Mm. You know, our sound was different. We was talking about different stuff. We was talking about you know tearing the club up and hit them and blah blah blah. And it was like our sound was like the mix of um rock music with rap music. Yeah. So it was crazy, and it um Atlanta ate it up because Atlanta, you know, they was. They was crunk, or at that time, they was ready to get crunk. I'm going to tell you a real funny story. Yeah. 
One day we came down here when Freak Nick was still going on. Uh huh. We drove down here in an Astro van <laughs> with Profit Profit Entertainment logos on the side of the van, and then we we put on these full body suits, and we uh, had staple guns, and we put posters all up and down Peachtree all over the street. Yeah, and then. We drove back to Memphis, jumped in our real cars, <laughs> which was like uh, uh, ca- uh, candy painted, um, uh, 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 photo Impalas. Yeah, yeah. All of us jumped in those cars and rolled back down here, scooped up some chase, blah, blah, blah. We probably in, we balled now. And we played like that somebody else did the promotion. We're like, oh, look, they got Prince's Mob and Posters all over this place. It's pretty cool. (laughs) The whole time it was us. Exactly. The whole time it was us. And then I never forget, I was on Peachtree right in front of, um, what's this big white hotel that y'all got uh, across the street from that theater? I know what you're talking about over there. Uh, Amigos uh, Amigos did a video in front of that theater. Yeah, I know it's Fox. I know it's the Fox, but I don't know the name of that hotel right there. That hotel right yeah. there. I like that hotel. Yeah. That uh we was uh we was right in front of that hotel on Peace Street doing um doing Freak Nick. And I gave a dude a mystic style C D. He looked at it, he like, what is this? He like <laughs> and he threw it out of the car. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> threw it out of the car. I was like, All right, whatever. And I just picked it up and just gave it to the next car. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, a year later, we were selling so many records in Atlanta, it was unbelievable. What was it like having y'all own label and knowing that y'all started that thing from scratch, though, and then doing the production behind it at the same time? It was great, man, because, like, you know, back in those days, man, we was uh, selling those records, what we what we was getting from the record company. Because, you know, back in those days, CDs were like sixteen ninety nine. That's right. That's so right. So we was getting $8.50 a unit. For those records, and we were selling like five hundred thousand, three, four hundred thousand. Uh, Little White, every album we put out on him sold like five hundred, four hundred thousand. So we was making millions and millions of dollars off the independent game. That's why today I still do the yeah. independent game. It ain't eight fifty these days because you know it's like nine ninety. Nine ninety nine a CD, so mm-hmm. we do like six dollars or whatever. But it's still that the independent game, man. You know, if you can do it, it costs more money to be independent. It's more work. Yeah. But if you can do it, you make way more money. Cause when you with a major label, you get like a dollar fifty, dollar sixty a label. Yeah. I mean, a, a record, and um, you independent, you can get like like I said, six to seven dollars. You can pretty much name your own price. You just don't want to shoot your seven foot. Exactly, exactly. The creative so process behind that music, though, Paul. Was y'all making them tracks first, or did y'all already had the hooks already together? How were y'all coming up with them bangers, man? Most of the time, we made the tracks first. Mm-hmm. We made the tracks first, and uh, then we would come up with the hooks. Uh-huh. It was very seldomly that we would um, make a, a a hook first and then come up with a a a, a beat, mm-hmm. but we usually always made the tracks first and then we just came up to them. So, um, like I make a track, Juicy would make a track, and then uh, me, Juicy, and Lord Infamous wrote most of the hooks. Gangsta Boo wrote a couple, but me, Juicy, and uh, Lord Infamous wrote most of the hooks once we heard the beat. So basically, what we did. We would make a beat in the studio, and it would be like thirty of us in the studio just hanging out, drinking, getting you know, blazed, blah 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 blah, and some other things that came mention on the radio. <laughs> and uh, or somebody would just pull somebody to the, they would just pull me in just to the side, like, oh, I got an idea, and then we just say like, oh, I like that, I don't like that, blah 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 blah, and then it just went from there. I mean, songs like Ted the Club, but uh, when you look up and they trying to ban them in the club because folks is getting their head bust down to the white meat every time it come nah. on. What was going through y'all mind when that song took off like that? That song, I'll tell you a funny story about that song. I mean, uh, um, back in the day, we had a couple of clubs. Mm-hmm. They had a Juicy J's Playhouse, and um, and we had, no, we had a Juicy J's Place mm-hmm. and DJ Paul's Playhouse. Yeah. 
two clubs we had. And uh, one night, uh, we had this one night where me and Juice, would, we would go to each other's club yeah. and, like, uh, guest DJ. Mm-hmm. So, like, if Juicy J had his night, I would come and, like, open up DJ for him. He would do the same for me. And uh, uh, <clears throat> Lord Infamous would be on the mic hyping and doing this, you know, for me. So um, one night we left the club and we went to McDonald's uh, by my house and uh, by my mama's house. We was living with my mama then. <laughs> and uh, I was like, I got an idea for a song. I said, it should be called Tear the Club Up. Because I was like, because we tear the club up when we do, do, we do the show. I saw this dude get killed in the club and it was a bad thing. Uh, rest his soul. But basically... Um, we was leaving the club, and we was in a lobby, and uh, all these dudes got to fighting. And then I heard a pop, pop. And uh, everybody just ran, and we didn't know what happened. Everybody ran. It was nobody on the floor. Nobody yeah. was on the floor. And I went to the bathroom, and the dude was up under the sink. And he got shot and went in through his, uh, like his right side of his body and went to his heart. Ooh. And he was up on the he was up on the sink like uh uh and I was like Jesus Christ and I was like uh I was like uh I told Lord him and I was like go get the security I was like I think this dude is dying or something uh, security came and he really did die and then I was we were sitting there we were sitting eating breakfast and I was like um we tear the club up man I was like we probably should make a song called Tear the Club Up yeah and we made this song and. Obviously, that song blew up, but um, yeah, it was a sad time though. I know that had to been crazy. I mean, speaking of tearing the club, it was on the up, news and everything. I know. Speaking of tearing the club up, though, it was the beginning and the birth of a style of music. Yeah. That was duplicated many times over, man. Yeah, still that been crunk, duplicated. Man. Talk to me about that. I mean, what made y'all say, you know what, we got some with this tear the club up, man. We gonna continue to get buck in this thing. Well, you know what the what it what it what that all came from is us being DJs. Uh-huh. You know, us being DJs. So um like when I would uh a lot of my songs I wrote just from DJing in the clubs, those two clubs I told you me and Juicy had. Yeah. Um I would just chant stuff. Yeah. So like I'd be like, I bet you won't hit him, blah blah blah, blah, blah <laughs> just and that. And whatever they react off of yeah. I went back the next day in my house and made a song off of it. Uh. So if I was never a DJ in clubs, I couldn't have never came up with that style. You know, that's how that style was created with us being DJs and just shouting out stuff and then it just going from there. How did y'all go from DJing to producing, though? Well, the producing came first. Okay. So this is how it happened. Um, I, I, uh, my brother... My brother uh, gave me some money to uh, get uh, studio equipment because I come from a, a, a musical family. Uh. I got a, um, my all my uncles had a gospel group called the Bogard Brothers. Mm-hmm. So I came from a musical family. So uh, you know, every Sunday, everybody would come to my mama's house and they'd be playing the guitar and the organ and all this. Mm-hmm. So. Um, um, I always wanted to do music. I was trying to do music ever since I was in like the fourth, fourth or fifth grade. Uh-huh. And I tell you another funny story about ATL. Uh, um, my the person who I was, um, I was his biggest fan probably. He lives in ATL. Mm. MC Shadi. Yeah, yeah. MC yeah. Shadi. And see, MC Shadi sounded like a kid. Mm. Even though he probably was like twenty some years old at the time, <laughs> yeah. he like I'm in the Johnny and I gotta be dumb. He had a real life voice, so I was like, if this little kid can do it, I can do it. <laughs> he wasn't even a kid. Man. I just talked to MC Shadi on a, a Twitter about a week ago. Yeah, but uh, he was a grown man, so I was like, if he can do it, I can do it. So I started trying to do it. My brother put some money behind us, and. Um, I put some equipment in the layaway. I eventually got my equipment out and um, just started doing it. Mm. The only reason I became a DJ is because it was a way to get the music out there. Uh-huh. So what I would do is I would mix all the hottest records, NWA, blah, 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 and then I sneak one of my songs in the middle. 
Yeah, yeah. Mix in another hot one. Yeah. Sneak one of my songs in the middle. And then eventually, by the time I got to volume four, it was just my songs. Uh-huh. And it was me, and it was uh, Lord of My Skinny Pimp, and all those guys. And yeah. from volume 14, I mean volume four, all the way up to volume 16 was just my songs with me, Juicy, and yeah. everybody else. Answer oh, me this how. question, though, Paul. Was there a time? Because when you look up and y'all are making millions, and you know you started off as a young DJ and producer in the club just getting busy, when you realized those dreams, was it what you expected it to be, or was it something that you felt like you didn't sign up for? No, it was way more than I expected it to be. We, didn't never, we never would have thought back in those days that we would have made millions of dollars and won an Oscar. Yeah. Come on, you can't even, you can't write, Hollywood can't write that. So it was uh it was way more than I thought it was gonna be, you know what I'm saying? Still today, you know, sitting here with you here right now, we're talking about twenty five years later. Ain't that many rappers can That's say true. that twenty five years later they still doing it, especially with the amount of music that we put out. So it's it's a lot of rappers that still out twenty five years later. Yeah. Not a lot, but it's some. Um, but nobody can say that they made about almost 100 CDs like we did. Between all the people we produced, yeah. even we produced the Diamond in the Bag for Ludacris. Yeah. We did that video over at the mall out here. I can't remember what mall parking lot we did that. I did a lot of production for Ludacris. Shout out to Ludacris. Love him. Uh-huh. And just um, some stuff for Titty Boy. Yeah. Uh, two chains. Yeah, yeah my yeah. boy, my boy. I've been knowing him since he was Titty Boy. Titty Boy, <laughs> Titty boy was in the riding and riding spinners video. That's right. That's right. We did that video uh, over by some uh, field one day. Mm. But, you know, we've been messing with Atlanta for the longest. And for uh, me to still be around after 25 years and still making songs that tell the cub of it's unbelievable, man. When y'all were making all of that music, though, were y'all so caught up in the moment of just making all of them records that y'all didn't realize that some of them records were going to be timeless? No, we never thought that. We just wanted to make good music, and we just wanted to keep the records rolling and just um, just keep it rolling. Because like I always say, I'm my biggest fan. Yeah. And that's the one thing that keeps me alive, I think, is me being my biggest fan and... um. I basically do it for me and all the hardcore three six mafia fans. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't really do it for the money these days or any of that. I just do it for the hardcore fans, and like I always say, it's a lot of, of musicians that I was a fan of that ain't around no more. You know, old um, uh, soul for singers. Yeah. So as long as I can uh, breathe and get up and program that drum machine and play that keyboard, I want to keep doing it, you know, until the end. I got to ask you about a few classics, man. Songs like Late Night Tip, man. I mean, that one crunk, but that was one of them songs that rolled so damn hard that, I mean, you had to put that thing on repeat and just ride out to it. Yeah, the the, the funny part about it is is when we got the... the, the, um, When we got that major record deal, we started trying different kind of records. Uh Uh-huh. And um, if you remember, Sipping on Scissor won Crump. Yeah. And coming from Tear the Club up to a singer like Sipping on Scissor was a big risk for us. Oh. It was a risk. You know, you you you, you, yeah. you look at it like now, it's just a hit yeah. song. But if you're in the studio, you'd be like, how are we going to go from hit them and Tear the Club up to a slow song like Sipping on Scissor? Mm. You know, it was scary for us. Yeah. It worked. I mean, how did that sipping on that scissor come about, man? Because, I mean, you got Pat on that hook doing his thing. You know, you know, we recorded that song in Atlanta. Oh. And I'm going to tell you something. We was on the way to Atlanta. It was the year y'all had, what y'all had here, the Super Bowl? Super Bowl. The Super Bowl. Yeah. And it was snowing like a fool. <laughs> so we almost died making that song. We came over a bridge. This, this boy, back in the day, I would get my boys, like, whoever would be like, Hey, Paul, they borrow a couple of dollars. And when they had a hand out for a couple of dollars, I would give them keys to their tour bus or that, <laughs> with a tour van at that time. Yeah. I'd be like, here you go, your couple of dollars. I need you to drive me down to Atlanta. I need you to, there you go. Time to work. Time to work. So um, he was driving fast, and um, <laughs> we came over a bridge. Uh-huh. 
And, you know, when the snow, you can't speed over the bridge because it ain't got the foundation up under. Yeah. So it'd be more icy. icy. We came over that bridge. Truck, we was in a, navigate, uh, nav- uh, a navigator that uh, we had back in the day. It yeah. started spinning all over the place, sp- spun over into the oncoming lane. We was on the way to Atlanta to record at Pimp C house. Pimp C lived in Atlanta then. Mm. He had a big old house across the street from, uh, what's the big R&B singer y'all got from here? Uh, Make It Last Forever. Uh, 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 Key Sweat. Key Sweat. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it spun over the other lane. Look, a rig was coming at us, blowing on like, duh, duh. I'm like, holy. Hey, my boy <laughs> trying to crank that like, duh, 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 I'm like, man, this is some straight TV right here. Me and Juicy got out the truck. Yeah. We just got out the truck and started running. I dropped my sky pager, which is terrible. <laughs> I dropped it in the snow. He finally crunked it up right before the rig came and drove off back into the grass. And the rig like, yeah. <laughs> we get to Atlanta. I don't even know how to get in touch with Pimp C because I lost the sky pager. Oh. So I finally, I think uh, we went to and did an interview on the radio station, and I shouted him out, and he came up to the radio station. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think it was the same radio station, too, but <laughs> we, uh, he, he came up to the radio station. He took us to the house. It was the drive, The house was on a big old hill, and the driveway was full of snow, so we couldn't even drive up the driveway. Yeah. So me, Juicy, Pimp C, Bum B, all of us made uh, um, a chain. Yeah. Bum B held onto the tree, and we made a chain, and we pulled each other up. So the first thing we did when we got in the house, we got, you know, messed yeah, up. right. We got messed up, and then we just started talking. And then I played the beat for him, and we had the hook in there already, and then we did the song, and then we left. But when we left, we slid down the driveway. I was like, all right, man, I'm out. And we just, and we just slid down the driveway, had fun, and we got about it. The funny part about it is on the way back, mm-hmm. I saw some skid marks by the bridge, way somewhere down the highway. And I was like, hey, man, I was like, this is like what we had to wreck at. I was like, pull up, we pull up, I found the sky pager. Full of snow, wet as hell. <laughs> found the sky pager, man. Crazy. So crazy. crazy. So crazy. But, you know, I was like, I always said when you had to put a lot of work into a song, mm-hmm. that it's going to be worth it. Yeah, yeah. And that song was worth it. I mean, was did y'all know when y'all got in there and put that thing together that, that was gonna be a, another classic for the catalog? I didn't. We didn't know at that time because, like I said, we were just trying something with it being a slow song. You yeah. know, it was a real slow song, and we coming from a crunk, crunk singles and crunk style. I didn't know what it was gonna do, but I was like, the song hard. Yeah, yeah. I was like, it probably, it probably ain't a first single, but it's a single. Yeah, and then when the record label heard the record label, like this, this is the song we want to go with. The uh, when we was with, with um Columbia at that time, uh-huh. and they was like, "This is the one we want to go with." And I was like, "All right, where's the thing?" <laughs> and then the, the good part about it was it was right out the big pimping. Yeah, yeah, it's right that out way, the big pimping. From an industry perspective. How do you maintain the heat with the records? You see what I'm saying? Without getting cold, did y'all feel like y'all had to keep on putting out the music to stay relevant, or did y'all wait for certain periods and times to drop? No, nah, we just we just wanted to keep putting out our records. Um, we didn't we didn't never wait. We always put out one. I guess it was every few years or a couple of years or whatever, and we just. We just wanted to put our records because we worked 24 hours. Yeah. So we had a studio, the studio in Memphis, and uh, we just worked around the clock pretty much anyways. Mm-hmm. And we had tons and tons of records. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we would take a break. We worked for like six months, and then the rest of the year we would just hang out and just pretty much barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much barbecue at my house and then just hang out. So sometimes we would work a long time. Sometimes we wouldn't. So we just had plenty of records, and it was good. Because, you know, back in those days, you know, we was uh, we was with Columbia, this and that, and they was like, you know, whenever you want to put out, bring out a record, we got these big advancements, which was millions of dollars. And I was like, well, man, we need to go in here and do this record. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do that record. We recorded it at our own studio, so we yeah. didn't spend no money. We recorded it now, get them big checks, 
sell millions of records and just chill the rest of the year, man, and just ride around Memphis and Maybags and Rolls Royces. <laughs> Did Which we was the to, only ones with those. Oh, did it ever get to a point, though, Paul, where you felt like this is just too easy? Already, You might hear something you're like, man, let me go ahead and just put this together, send this out, and uh, make another hit right quick. No, it didn't because, you know, I don't I don't know why. We, it it should have got to that point. You would think it would. Yeah. But it didn't, though. It was like because we was having so much fun doing it. We was having so much fun doing it, so it was never really like we concentrated too hard on it. We just really just like went in and did the songs. And back in those days, you didn't have email, so you had to FedEx a DAT, a DAT player yeah, yeah. to New York, to the record label. And we would just send it to them, and every song we sent them, they liked it. And I was like, yeah, whatever. What a shit. Being a label head and having all of them artists on the label, how did you deal with the egos and trying to make everybody happy and keep everything as a cohesive, uh, cohesive unit? So well, okay, that, that was the hard part. That's when it only got. That's when it got hard because we were so young. So we were so young and we was making so much money and then we was, um, you know, we was getting high and all this. <laughs> so um, that that made it that made it hard. But for the most part, we was all family and everybody was happy, you know. But um, it made it get hard from time to time because somebody might write a song that somebody don't like or this and that, and then it would cause a little conflict in the studio. But we were always figured out at the end. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We always figured out at the end. We would always just come up with uh, what's, what's good. And then we would do this one thing. But we would bring like forty friends in the studio, mm. and we would play the whole album, mm. and we would be like, "Don't put your names on this list. Just say what song you like, and uh, put how many stars beside it that you liked or whatever, and um, and just put it in there. So would nobody feel guilty if they didn't like a song? They put one star or yeah. whatever. So um." They would put their, uh, all their, um, their uh, tags in the bag at the end, mm-hmm. and then that's how we would uh, go by what songs would stay on the album, yeah. what song would be the single, and this and that. And then we would send um, songs to the DJs. Mm-hmm. So Sony had a list of all the popular DJs. Like one of them uh, coming out of Houston was a uh, was a uh, Michael Watts. Mm-hmm. We had Greg Street. Yeah. We had uh, different DJs that the major, the label did. Mm-hmm. And they would send them to those DJs and they'd be like, do you like this song? Yes or no, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And then that's how we would pick them. Now, on another note with the collabs, man, that player while you're hating with the hot boys, man, how did that joint come about? Because that was another one of my favorites right there, too. That was a real funny story. Like, before I knew about Cash money, well, I knew about cash money, but before I knew about Hot Boys, mm-hmm. Wayne and Juvenile and yeah. all them, um, I used to listen to this uh, group that they had that was called, oh, Jesus Christ, what was their name? It was another group. It was like the first group that was signed to cash money. UNLV? UNLV. Yeah. I used to listen to UNLV. If you remember, later on, Cash Money redid one of UNLV songs. That that dun, is dun, dun, dun. Yeah. yeah. So I was a fan of UNLV, and I I called, uh, I contacted Birdman. I was like, I want to do a song with UNLV. And at that time, I think that they was uh, wasn't with the label no more. Uh-huh. And he was like, um, you know, they're not around no more, but I got my new group blah, 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 Cash Money, Wayne, blah, 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 and this and that. And uh, I checked them out, and they was dope, obviously. And I was like, let's do that. And I, I, I got them to come to Memphis. They came to Memphis. Mm-hmm. And um, we did that song. We did a bunch of songs. We did probably like three songs, uh-huh. three songs while they was up there. And I never forget, I always tell the story every time I go to TGI Fridays. <laughs> um Birdman's favorite dish at TGI Fridays was the Cajun chicken pasta. Uh-huh. 
So um, every time I go to TGI Fries and order the T, uh, the Cajun chicken pasta, I always tell people how Birdman put me on there because we had TGI Fries would deliver to our studio, and um, they 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 never knew that they was delivering to Lil Wayne <laughs> and uh, you know Birdman and Juvenile yeah. and all that. Yeah, but um. It was cool, and then we did that song. We did the video, man. It was crazy. We did a bunch of songs with them, man. A bunch of songs. I mean, the international players anthem though with Cass. I mean, UGK together. I mean, it was a beautiful thing to see everybody come together on that track. But I ain't gonna lie though, that boy Pat did that track some justice too, man. Yeah. yeah so I mean, that that, that kind of caught me off guard because I like now Pat he was hell on there too. But then the track was so damn hard, it just didn't matter. Like yeah. let run it thing back. Yeah, yeah. How did them jumps come about? When we did uh um when we did uh, um ballers. Uh-huh. You know, baller, we be yeah, on some twinkies, twinkies. Play right. yeah. That Thank song you. was where we got the sip it on scissor hook from. Uh yeah. If you listen to that verse, you, mm-hmm. you hear it says sipping on some scissor, bump in a scissor, bump in a That's where we got that from. So that song right there was extra great for us. Yeah, yeah. Because it doubled as a couple of hits. <laughs> hey. It doubled as a couple of hits. So yeah. that was great. Now, when you hooked up with UGK and Cass, though, how was that when y'all came together for the International Players Anthem? We did International Players Anthem. Just how that happened. Um, um, Project Pat had an album that I, I produced the track Choose You For. That's right. And then... um. Sony didn't really promote the album, that that single. They promote the album, they didn't really promote the single. So the single only did a little something. They killed it in Memphis, but it yeah. didn't do nothing really to the rest of the world. So Pimp C was in jail at that time. Uh. Pimp C was in jail, and uh, Pimp C called me, and he's like, when I get out of jail, I'm coming to your house in L.A., and I want to redo that song. He said, don't change nothing from the beat. I want it to be just like it is. I still did a couple of little changes, but that's just me. Yeah. But um, he came to my, when he got out of jail, he came to my house. And um, he had an Atlanta artist with him. I can't think, I can't remember the boy's name, but he was a little kid at that time. He was signed to Too Short, I think. What was that boy's name? Like, Lou. What? Little something, little something, but I can't remember. He signed Two Show because you know Two Show was down. Yeah, I remember Two Show being down here. Yeah, so uh, um, he brought he brought uh, him with him to the studio, and um, we did um, Choose You. We did the Players Anthem, uh-huh. and Sony. That was like around the time when Three Six Mafia were like super super high. So uh, Sony was like, uh, they can't have y'all on a single. But y'all gonna be on the album, so they end up choosing Outkast mm-hmm. to be on the single, which is great. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I get paid off the record regardless. So exactly. I'm like, yeah, put the put the biggest <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so uh, we went and did the video. We did the video in L.A. and um, the press had the video, and it was UGK's first number one single. But the cool part about it is "Sipping on Scissor" was our first number one single. That's cold. So it's like, yeah, we yeah. rubbed each other, you know, exactly. we scratched each other back. Exactly. So it was cool. That's crazy. I got to take it to another area, though, man. I mean, that choices, movies, soundtrack, both equally hard as hell, man. What was it like putting that thing together? Choices movie. We was um, we were sitting back looking how um, how they did the murder was the case movie. Uh. Murder was the case, I think it was like 20 minutes long or something. Mm-hmm. So we went and filmed um, a little movie, The Choices. The original one was maybe like 15 or 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. And then we showed it to some people, and people loved it. So I was like, man, we should make this movie longer and really sell it. Mm-hmm. So we made it longer. We made it into, we went and made it into a full movie. Mm-hmm. And, um, we did a joint venture deal with uh, Sony. Uh-huh. And back in those days, DVDs was $20. So we did a 10-10 split. And we ended up selling about 300,000 copies of that DVD. We got a plaque at the house that said double platinum, which you go double platinum on DVDs if you sold uh, 200. Yeah. 
So um, I don't know how many is unsold by now, but we put it out and it blew up and it just became a, a hood anthem. It was like the Scarface almost for for rap movies or whatever. It was crazy. What was it that gave y'all the guts to go ahead and say, you know what, we're going to put up this money and put this movie out like this and just sit down. And the time to sit down and write it, was that during the off time or how do y'all do that? Yeah, it was, we wrote it during off time. And I mean, we we made that movie like fresh off Sipping on Scissor. Uh-huh. So at that time, like anything we put out, people was going to buy. Yeah. And we did it. Because we always wanted to get into the Hollywood scene anyway. Mm-hmm. And that, that movie, you know, obviously made our way to the Oscar. Yeah. I mean, tell me about that Oscar, man. I mean, what was that feeling like, man? And then how did, I mean, that song even come up, come about, uh, Hard Out Here for a Pimp? It was crazy. Um, I I had a brother back in the day that um, he got killed in, like, 91. But he was a pimp, and he got killed by one of his girls that had a trick that, um, that uh, like, fell in love with her or whatever. Mm-hmm. So they set my brother up, and they killed my brother. But uh, we kind of just wrote it out, the history of being in Memphis and all the pimping that goes on there and the story of my brother and us and that and the script from the movie that they gave us. Mm-hmm. They gave us a script from the movie. So between, you know, the history of being in a city like that, uh, in Memphis, there was home, you know, pretty much home of Pippin like that at that time outside of like San Francisco, this and that, where Iceberg Slim and all of them came from. Uh-huh. It was pretty easy to write. Mm. What was going through your mind when you look up and you won an Oscar for that thing, though? That, that was another story. That was crazy. <laughs> you know, that was crazy. It was just, uh, um, it was unbelievable, man. You know, um, to accomplish something like that, you know, and I thought all the other songs was great. Um, I love the Bo- the Burr York song for the movie Crash, you know, and um, I loved all the Dolly Parton song. I was there. Obviously, we all grew up loving Dolly Parton. Yeah. And um, it was it was great. But when we won it, you know, I really couldn't believe it. You know, it's, it's still today, I sit back and I really don't believe it. Mm. What makes it so hard to believe, though, because after all of that success and coming from the hood and just blowing up like that, I mean, that should have just been another one in the can by then. Yeah, but uh, I, I, yeah, a Grammy should have been another one in the can because that's for music, not an Oscar. <laughs> yeah. We don't win Oscar. Still today, we're the only rap group that ever won Oscar. And we, I don't know if we might ever, forever be the only one. I don't know. You never know. It's, it's, it's hard to get. But... um. That was that was the main thing because it was for movies. I mean, you know, we wasn't into movies; we was into music. Mm-hmm. So for us to get that, that that was crazy. Now another question though: that reality show, that show was funny as hell. Okay, yeah. what made y'all get into reality before it was even trendy like it is now? And I mean, how were y'all able to kind of script that thing to make it come across so funny? Yeah, oh, I, what I used to do was I always wanted us to have a, a TV show. Uh-huh. And because uh, I grew up on uh, Sanford and Son. That's right. And I used to always want us to have a TV show. So I basically just filmed us just hanging out in the studio uh, around Memphis doing that. And um, I gave it to my lawyer. And I was like, I want you to get us to some, uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, networks and see if we can uh, get a deal or something from it. And at that time, people wasn't doing reality shows like that. People actually got mad at 360 Mafia for doing that reality show. They was like, oh, I can't believe Because, you know, everybody always wants you to stay underground. <laughs> they don't like So they're like, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. Blah, 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 blah. God, they was hating like a fool. And now people beg to have reality shows. Yeah. Yeah. But at that time, they didn't like it, and they thought that we wasn't keeping it real by having a reality show. But, uh, you know, once they watched it, they was like, you know, it's funny, and it's crazy, and, um, you know, it ended up blowing up. But uh, from the beginning, with, they was hating on it. Speaking of the hate, man, how did y'all deal with the hate in the game from the beginning all the way up through? 
because I know you got that motivated song. That was another one of my bangers yeah. that I love. You see what I'm saying? When I'm dealing with my personal hate, yeah. how did y'all deal with y'all? Well, we just wrote songs off of it. Yeah. That's the best way to deal with uh with hate is just um build off of it. You know, because the 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 hate motivate, you know, if you um if you got people hating on you then that means you're doing something right. You know, obviously if you ain't got nobody hating on you then just something ain't ain't real. Something ain't, ain't something ain't right right there. So we just used it as um motivation to write songs. Any obstacles did y'all see coming up in the game? Because, I mean, I know you say y'all jumped out there and stuff kind of took off, but what were the obstacles that you had trying to keep everything afloat so you could make it to that next advance? The, the, the hardest obstacle was us being from the South. Hmm. You know, being uh, us being from the South, because at that time everybody that was really doing it was uh, from, like, New York yeah. or L.A. You know, you had your few... There was like the ghetto boys down in Texas and um, Luke Skywalker and Two Line crew down in Miami, but for the most part, for the most part, it was nobody doing it in the South like that, except like Outkast. You know, yeah. we had Outkast, and we had uh, what's my guy name? I put my hand up on my hip. When I did <laughs> yeah, it, freak yeah. nasty, was it? But it, for the most part, it wasn't a lot of uh, artists out the mid South. Yeah, that was doing it at that time. So that was the hardest part for us. But how we came up over that is we just put our, our own money behind our records. Yeah. Now, during that time, though, man, the competition was fierce. I mean, you had artists in the South, East, West, Midwest, all over the place that were just kind of crazy. And how was that for y'all trying to compete in that marketplace? Because you got... The folks on the East Coast doing their thing on the West. But in the South, folks were still bringing it now. Yeah. How was it doing that golden era of hip-hop for y'all when y'all looked up? It was crazy for us because uh, I'm going to tell you what started blowing us up. It was a um, jukebox. Mm. You remember jukebox? Mm. Jukebox where you could uh, pay to view videos, whatever it was back in the day. They was out of Miami. And... Uh, people would uh, request the hell out of Tether Club of video. And we would be like one of the only like little Southern, it was other Southern videos. Like I said, you know, we had Outkast and all that, but uh, shout out to Outkast, love Outkast. Mm -hmm. um, um, but we was one of the only, well, we was the only video that was on that craziness mm -hmm. that was coming out. So we had the videos, on the video, we had these wrestling masks on because I was all I was into wrestling. Yeah, was tough at that yeah. time. So I got this lady to make us these wrestling masks, mm -hmm. and um, that video right there being on that jukebox is what really, really blew us up, and that's what made us get ahead of some of the other artists that we was um, up against at that time. Uh -huh. Did y'all, when y'all would listen to the other artists, though, did y'all feel any pressure to perform? No. No. And then how did y'all feel about y'all production up against everybody else's production? Because y'all had some crazy stuff coming out of there, man. Yeah. I, well, I thought I was, was the best. Yeah. And I was like, I knew what we had going was a a, a, a dope product. Did y'all have a lot of folks trying to get that sound from y'all? Well, everybody took that sound from us. <laughs> Everybody take that sound. They still take that sound. Yeah. Even to the day, that sound is still uh, around. And it's come, it's re-coming back around, as I started to notice. Mm -hmm. How do you feel when you see the youngsters out here kind of sounding like a young 3-6? I actually like it, you know. I actually like it, you know. I like I like for them to keep the sound around. One of my favorite um, rappers out right now is um, Waka Flocka. Yeah. And Waka Flocka, I feel, was the first person to kind of re-bring it back around. Uh -huh. And I like that. We actually did a song with Waka back in the day, and um, I'm a Waka fan. I'm a Waka fan, and um, I like how he brought it back around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, he brought it back around to, like, a, a major way. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Know. I so, mean, lastly, the passing of Lord and Coopster, man. 
Yeah. How had that affected you when that stuff hit? Oh man, it, it affected me a lot because um, both of them passed at the same age. Mm. They're the same age, same age I am now. Yeah. Which makes it even weirder. But uh, um, they um, there was uh, the, a lot of the new album I wrote toward them, mm -hmm. not not toward Coop because Coop was still alive when I wrote the album. But to look toward Lord Elfman's the passing of him and the passing of a lot of our other personal friends who as well died around the same age or whatever that we went to school with. Yeah. So uh I put a little more feeling into this album than basically just the regular talk, talk, talk mm -hmm. that uh, you know, rappers tend to do. I I put um a little more feeling into it and talked about a, a lot of more personal situations mm -hmm. that I've been going through the last, you know, two years. The last two years I done paid for four funerals. And funerals ain't cheap. <laughs> I <laughs> know. Like, Jesus I know. Christ, but funerals ain't cheap. But, um, the, uh, yeah, I paid for four funerals in the last uh, two years and, um, and that's that's what influenced a lot of the new album, mm -hmm. you know, just uh, all of the stuff that went on with all the friends and family. I can dig it. Master Evil, the tour, all that good stuff, man. Anything else you want to say about it? Man, you know, just um, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at DJ Paul K O M King of Memphis. And uh, man, I love y'all. ATL, keep. Her promoting your boy and uh, keep uh, supporting your boy. And, uh, man, I love y'all. And for everybody else that's out there listening, man, I love y'all too, man. I'm going to keep doing it for y'all. 100, man. Well, Paul, appreciate you coming through this thing, boss. Yeah, Already. Yeah. I appreciate you, number, you the best. having me. Much success. Appreciate Beehive Radio, shout it. DJ Paul, it's out 107.9, man. Let go.